When you give somebody that doesn't have purpose, purpose and hope and confidence, their entire being changes. That's Dr. Kevin Burkopes. Hear how he is changing education and communities on the Hopeful Hoosier podcast, episode 13. I'm your host, Andy Dix. I'm producing this episode shortly following the holidays of 2019. Welcome to 2020. As I walked my dogs around my neighborhood in Indianapolis on the first trash day following the holiday, I saw one thing in common. Many empty Amazon boxes filled the trash cans. If you are like most people, you probably did a considerable amount of online shopping. But what if this shopping shift is really the tip of a much bigger iceberg of modern culture? What if our desires for the best goods and services at the cheapest prices have led us away from our neighborhood main streets to first the suburban shopping malls and superstores, and now the virtual stores? Have we actually accelerated the decline of the hearts of our neighborhood gathering spaces? Some communities were once filled with locally owned and operated businesses within walking distance of your home. An independent neighborhood grocer, butcher, hardware store, dry cleaners, barber and beauty salon, a diner, florist, corner drug store, and funeral parlor. Oftentimes these thriving businesses were on a main community street and sometimes near a common community park. We walked to school and could get our health care from a local doctor and dentist just around the corner from home. These locally owned and operated businesses provided good jobs for a couple of generations of family and neighbors. Did people feel more connected to each other? Were they more proud of their neighborhood? Were they invested in seeing it continue to thrive? Fewer and fewer Indiana places resemble these idyllic memories anymore. Neighborhoods of today, especially in the suburbs, have few, if any, public businesses. This means we have less opportunities to meet and befriend our neighbors and share our common life experiences. In under-resourced neighborhoods, it's even worse. Local schools have been closed, food deserts limit access to healthy foods, crime, drugs, and gangs move in, and working families hope one day to maybe move out, perhaps reusing empty Amazon boxes. For Dr. Kevin Burkopes, a PhD in educational mathematics, the subtraction of so much of what makes civil society rich and vibrant didn't add up. He has created a new formula for neighborhood and community success, and it begins with a new type of school. He calls it a community commons, a new peer-to-peer -peer approach to educating our children, and a commitment to the power of entrepreneurism and capitalism. I interviewed Dr. Burkopes in his amazing model learning laboratory called A Learning Commons on Indianapolis's near west side at the offices of his four ventures, the primary being a nonprofit he founded called Crossroads Education. Have a seat in an innovative learning table with us and meet a true hopeful Hoosier. I began our conversation by asking Kevin to explain his concept behind this creativity inducing room he calls A Learning Commons. The tools of operating here are based on two different ideas. We have ancient technology, which is human beings really connect with each other. And we've, since very early times, we've connected in ways where we're hanging out, we're talking, we're using language to solve problems, solve immediate problems, big problems, little problems. But then we've had surfaces to ride on. So what we build into a, what we call a learning commons is we activate every surface possible. So tabletops are whiteboards, the walls are whiteboards, we have screens that we can move around that are whiteboards, we have markers, uh, paper, pencils, you name it. So an, a learning commons takes any space and activates it, and then also puts the second type of technology in place, which the ancient is hanging out with each other and writing. The cutting edge technologies, we have 65 inch flat screens that have some of the, the most state of the art uh, touchscreen capabilities, and then our software that we deliver through our uh, software as service company augments the ability to connect in a you know personal way in the learning commons. So we try to blend. We call this a blended learning environment where you have the ability to work by yourself. You have the ability to work with your peers, which is the most powerful thing that we uh, believe is possible in education. And then you can work with a just beyond peer, be it an adult or somebody that is, has expertise that you do not have. And it's really about 
not only effective communication, but also you're spurring somebody's creativity. Yeah, I, creativity comes from us teaching each other and, and thinking through problems. So people talk to us all the time about how, well, I'm a visual learner and I never got that access in school. Well, guess what? We're all visual learners. We're all creative. We just don't think of ourselves that way because it's been framed through the traditional education system to create human beings that do not think of themselves as creative, but much more of a sort of a passive, docile learner. So our learning commons is supposed to flip that completely on its head. Everyone's creative, which is one of our key core tenets. Everybody's an educator. I cannot rise unless my community rises with me, which means the only reason you know something is to teach someone else. Uh, and then the, the very idea of, of communication and collaboration, so we're in this together. Those are our core tenets that we try to build into this activated space, but also through our methodology of teaching people how to be educators. So in, in your ideal learning environment, it's absolutely okay to write on the table. Yeah, yeah you're not going to get in trouble for doing that. That's awesome. Uh, we, we want every single space to be used to help you get ideas out of your head and let them collide with others. Excellent. So let's talk about your, your background. You're, you're a PhD in math education, correct? And your whole life is devoted to solving mathematical problems, but you've taken on this much bigger, broader problem of, of education as a whole and, and have come up with a unique formula for success. So let's frame out sort of the way you see the problem as it exists today before you start implementing learning commons and other solutions. So problem as it exists today in the education space, my classical training in the K-20 through system has probably augmented my own inner sort of capacity to be a complex problem solver. If you want to think about some of the most complex problems out there, try to impact socially created human systems, right? And education is most assuredly a created human system that has multiple bands uh, around it. So as I Graduated at 21, uh, had a math degree from Purdue. I, uh, I started teaching in low-resourced schools, some because of a social justice thing and some because of my interest in uh, learning more about what I didn't understand. One of the main things that I don't understand, and to this day I'm continuously augmenting my capacity to understand, is how human systems can be inequitable. So I worked in a really low-resource school in North Carolina and worked with Kids making, you know, 27,005 was my first salary and started learning about what it means to have s sort of systemic inequities, both in gender and race and socioeconomic class. And so one of the things that is a core tenant or a, a core piece of this formula of, of what we're trying to develop is this idea of why is there a lack of access for you know, kids in, in a school like what we're working on here on the west side of Indianapolis or where I worked at in uh, North Carolina and Chicago and New York and Texas. What I saw was that, you know, maybe four miles apart, two out of 100 kids pass a test and just a few miles away, 98 out of every 100 kids pass a test. The difference between those two is, is uh, you know, just systemic inequities. And it's it's really is a system that now has built these inequities into its fabric, and therefore schools that are predominantly African-American and, and Latinx community schools are failing at a rate that is 9, 10, 12 times worse than what you would see at a school that was predominantly white or Caucasian. I, I've never heard the term you're using, and it fascinates me. Tell me some more and give me some examples of the systemic inequities. Okay, so um, what does it mean that a young person that goes to school in a public school located in a low socioeconomic neighborhood, the likelihood of a young African-American male, for example, at that school to pass a standardized test, which I uh, find repugnant, but it is something that we are being held accountable to in the education system, the likelihood of them passing is about 7%. If they get through that and they go on to study uh, a STEM field in uh, you know, STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics fields at a university, the likelihood of them persisting there is less than 7%. So now we've created this system where, through complex reasons, that it is almost impossible to get a career in a chosen field that has to do with, uh, as a mathematics backing. Uh, a lot of that is problematic is the 
types of teachers that we have in the system, uh, the access to quality support, curriculum, facilities, uh, professionals, family. These are all problems that lead to this sort of siphoning out of these really talented young people. So if you go to a school like the schools that we work in, the turnover rate for teachers in those schools is often by October you lose one out of five. By the end of the year, you're about half your teachers are gone. And now you have this sort of, I have to hire long-term subs. I have to hire people that have a background in language to teach mathematics, uh, which they frankly cannot. So now you have a young kid that goes to a, a, a public school like the ones uh, that we work in here in Indy, and they haven't had a certified mathematics teacher for four years. So when they get to high school and they're four years behind, whose fault is that? It's not the young person's. And then is that the only way that we can do this? That was part of this sort of this, this changeover, right? So I saw this in Chicago. I saw it in Texas and North Carolina when I was tutoring in New York and other places. And I saw that we have a, a workforce problem. And it's not the way people are describing it. We have good people in education. We have some of the most wonderful humans that decide that they're going to take part in the parenting of hundreds of kids per day, while not being compensated for the un unbelievable amount of stress and work that that uh, requires. So they get into the system, and then they get slowly kind of drowned by it, and the turnover rate is so high that we have good people, but they don't stay. So if we have a workforce that is fantastic but doesn't stay, then we don't have a workforce. So if that's the case, what is a workforce that would persist, that is scalable, uh, we can recruit, we can train, and is affordable? And um, over the years, as I was kind of working through these models, what I came up with is that it's the kids in the schools. They're there. They would take $100 a week and love it, where you and I probably wouldn't. Uh, they're highly malleable and trainable and passionate on working with each other. They're the best to work with each other because they connect in ways that you and I cannot recreate. We're too old, right? We're from a different generation, which is very true. Um, they're growing up with smartphones. I didn't know what a smartphone was until 10 years ago, right? That's a decent way into my adult life. So push those together and then we tried to figure out what does it really mean to have young people teaching each other at scale for an ecosystem? And that's where we started to get into not only is this an answer to these systemic inequities where we don't get access to high quality experiences, curriculum, and uh, educational experiences, but we're using money in completely inequitable ways. So we still have to pay an FTE that cannot do the job to s sort of babysit a classroom of kids. While as you know, four miles away, we pay an FTE to execute almost the exact same labor cost we pay an FTE to execute a high-quality Algebra two experience. Those kids and those kids cognitively are 99% the same. What they get access to isn't even on the same map. Do that a few years, now you have social inequities that are massive. So these kids are predominantly well-resourced kids that have a family background, and they don't have poverty and trauma and other things that they're dealing with. These kids are not only dealing with social inequities at school where it is a traumatic experience to be told to be docile and sit in a classroom and other things, but then they go home to violence and trauma and everything else. So we're not even using the fact that they're in school for 40% of their awake life in an advantage way because we have more trauma being heaped on a trauma-filled population of kids. How is that helping? What we found is that they were failing at such a high rate that when we got into that school and said, you're, you're a teacher now. My expectation is that you teach your peers and we're gonna train you on how to do that and you're gonna build this learning commons with us. And then six, eight months later after having that experience, they all passed the test. So 100% of our tutors have passed. They've never failed a standardized test that we've presented for the ones that we put through our training. Uh, and that have executed an education paradigm. If only seven out of 100 or two out of 100 are passing, when we have a classroom passive experience with that population of students, and then we have 100% pass here, what are we doing? I don't have a good answer for that. I think our systemic system was built around the idea that we had only a certain percentage of our population did we want to be educated. That's a mistake. 
because it's going to cost $300,000 to take that kid that we expelled and put them in jail for the rest of their lives. That's a way more expense than what we're paying for them to get educated. Uh, and not to mention the other so, you know, sort of inequities and, and uh, things that go along with that uh, school to uh, prison pipeline. Kevin, let me back you up just a little bit. Make it real for me what you really saw in this current state, for example. Paint me the real picture of what it's like in this school that you were in firsthand and what kind of challenges you were up against. Yes, I'll tell you some stories. My first school experience, I'm a recent graduate in the middle of a state that I didn't know, working in a community that I didn't understand, had a lot of ideas about what I could do since I um, you know, was one of the most probably technically sound math teachers at that school. Uh, I walked into a situation with high poverty, high crime, high trauma. I didn't know any of those words. I didn't know what they meant. Didn't have textbooks, so the school didn't have textbooks. I was making $1,600 take-home pay and had uh, a nice varsity cross-country coach uh, where my stipend was $237 total, and that was every day uh, with, I think, 14 meets. So you can imagine I was making about $0.07 cents an hour. And my first day of the first class that I ever taught I walked into a classroom of 35, pretty diverse group of kids, mostly low-resourced students from this community, which was, you know, kind of a rural community in North Carolina. A lot of Latinx, African-American, and uh, low-resourced white kids. And I had this idea in my head that, you know, I'm the, the savior, right? Which is a terrible, terrible idea. But as a 21, 22-year-old, that was what I thought I was doing. So I had this great idea that uh, we could be active and I could throw a tennis ball because I was also the tennis coach and people would catch it and answer questions and everyone would love math, right? Because that's, that's the way it goes. The first kid that I threw the tennis ball to stood up, screamed profanities at me and rifled the ball into my face and blackened my eye on day one. That was my first day of teaching. I would guess that most other people that would experience the first couple of days of teaching that I experienced would be gone before October. Uh, we had fights every day. We had fires in the hallways. We had all sorts of things. We had arrests. We had violence. We had kids selling drugs. And it was, to my eyes, insane that we were taking these kids who obviously needed a lot more than algebra. And we were making them set in 55-minute courses seven times a day with no breaks, no physical activity, and just sort of herding them like cattle through classrooms. That was my first experience with saying, you know, I thought my education background was lacking in terms of equity. I didn't know what a credit hour was when I showed up to college. And I thought, surely there's a better way of doing it. And then I spent an undergraduate learning mathematics from professors who were from countries that I had never heard of and lectured at us in, you know, 250 years of math in 16 weeks. And I thought, well, maybe the reason I'm struggling is because this isn't for me. If I experienced that, what do you think those kids would ever experience if they persisted to college? Uh, If I had stereotype threat, how bad would it be for others? And I started to learn that, that experience. And then when I started to look around at these young people and realize that if you take certain parts of what you saw in them, the, um, you know, the frustrations, right? The, the language and the violence and other things. And you looked at them just cognitively, they were brilliant. They could do math in their heads extremely fast right before they would, you know, grab their neighbor or something. And, uh, I started thinking through this, we have a system that is completely and totally disregarding these kids because where are they going to go after they finish with this experience and what have we done with that experience from five-year-old to 18-year-old that will benefit society in redeemable ways and I I believe I still have the answer that we're not doing enough. If you were going to sum up the formula that you were currently seeing, what's the product? What, what were you actually seeing as a result of the inputs that the education system was giving this, in, in spite of your best efforts, what was the outcome? 
we have an industrialized system built on the idea of creating a product that is impossible to create. So industrialized systems are factory-based assembly lines. You keep adding on parts until you have the final product. But what we know about cognitive science and neuroscience, humans don't learn that way. And there's this thing called decay. What you learned three weeks ago, if you don't use it again or expound on it, you lose that capacity. So the idea that taking a class and you're just continuously building on knowledge without ever going and revisiting that knowledge is a completely useless system. Of, and that's what high school is right now. It's even worse. That's what undergrad is. You don't even remember what you were like as a freshman when you're getting ready to graduate, and you certainly haven't revisited those courses. So how many of the 130 credits that you took are actually still impactful or useful, or have you acquired a skill that you can then use to be employed? I didn't have good answers for that. I did know that what we were teaching young people uh, in the courses that I was teaching wasn't useful for them, other than we were giving them a mental workout. Well, you know as well as I do, any type of workout, if you don't persist with that, it's a labor that becomes lost. So what could we do differently? And that question just, I mean, it plagued me. It was like, gosh, I'm fighting, right? This, this, I've made math available to these kids. I've done all sorts of backflips to help them understand and make connections and and all of these things. And, uh, And it still wasn't working because it was bigger than my classroom. So what does it look like to impact a school or a system or a university? Maybe that's where we start. You know, we we have an expectation of what education can provide. And I think the underlying assumption is that we can still create this, like, basic facts through a a well-oiled machine. And that's just not true. And then it's also not true that our brains operate exactly the same when we come from trauma uh, and other experiences, because it's they actually form differently, and what, now we know that, and it's kind of like, well, yeah, you know, me looking at a kid that grew up in a low resource community who's worried about safety, when they get to school, me looking at them and saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's all it takes to really get ahead. That's not true, uh, and that basic underlying premise is, is still pretty pervasive in our community. Class might be the warmest, safest place to sleep. It should be. School should be the safest place for all kids that come from those environments. But instead, when he's sleeping, what do we do? We yell at him, we scream at him, we kick him out of school. We wake him up, and then he curses you, and now you expel him. Great. What have we done for that kid? We we do things to kids. We don't do things for them. There's a big difference. We would not conduct ourselves the way that we do in our public systems if we were thinking that it is partly our responsibility to parent and raise these children, because it is. We're doing it right now, just nobody's using that language. And we can't start saying, well, I'm just a classroom teacher, I'm here to teach math. No, you're not. You are there to help raise them. And if you do a poor job, and the school does a poor job, and the parents do a poor job, and places of faith do a poor job, and community centers do a poor job, no one's raising them. And an unraised, unloved human that's 15 to 18 years old is extremely dangerous. Why don't we talk that way? Uh, I don't know. So you were a black-eyed, idealistic teacher. What got you back for days three and four when most people would have said, I am way underpaid to do this. I'm out of here. I got chips on both of my shoulders. The sense of social justice and also this underlying idea that surely there is a way that you can make this work. So I took that, that work, and then I had other people say, you know, what about moving from this place, right, this geographic region, and moving to, like, a big city? Have you ever thought about what you could do there and what, what you could learn there? And that was, I had some people that were from Chicago that were down there, and um, that's how I started to move around was, like, what does it look like to work in Inglewood in the south side of Chicago compared to what it looks like to work in, you know, Vail, North Carolina, uh, where there's, you know, no skyscrapers and a couple of stoplights. And then you get to the south side of Chicago and you have to learn things like gang territory and you have to bury kids because I buried a lot of kids, unfortunately. I think there's a sense of, of adventure there uh, that I carry 
with me daily, a sense of wonderment and what I don't know, and then also a sense of what if nobody else is trying to do this? And then you meet a whole bunch of people that are, right? But, uh, yeah, I would say that that's what persisted. So if we, if we want to sum it up, it sounds like what you were saying was, in your heart of hearts, this is not fair, and more importantly, this doesn't add up, this isn't working. And what could we do to actually solve it? So what do I have to arm myself with to be- better understand why these inequities work the way that they do? And that's information, that's experience. Uh, you don't get that from reading books. Uh, you get that from living the, f- the actual fight of trying to do something right by a group of kids that come from things that are not right. And that was the experience of maybe the first, I don't know, 10 years was one stop after another. You see things from, you know, children that were abused, trafficked, gang violence, poverty, brilliance, right? mixed with a a lack of capacity to understand right from wrong to a certain extent that all 16-year-olds carry. But when a kid that comes from those communities makes a mistake, right, they they decide they're going to kick in a door and just go into an apartment or whatever, They they go to juvie or prison or jail. Kids in other environments do that, and it's like, well, it's kids being kids. Let's slap them on the wrist, and let's take care of them and parent them better. And mom and dad, you should know better. Well, they don't do that here. The kids that are here are oftentimes young, young people of color. The kids that are here are oftentimes well-resourced white kids. I just kept seeing evidence of that over and over again. And then I was lucky enough to have a lot of friends because I lived in communities and neighborhoods of color where I was accepted. And then I got to ask hard questions like, what do you really think about this? And talk to me about what racism really is. And help me understand why I'm accepted this way, whereas others that look like me are not. What kind of answers did they give you? I think it was a lot of, of really interesting conversations around how my eyes do not see the same thing as someone else's. And the reasons for that could be relatively obvious if you're sort of framing in a way like you're colorblind and I'm not, right? Like, we, I just don't see purple, But our lenses are very, very different that we don't see things the way that we could see them because we don't have the lived experience to match them in. So I I, I had never had the experience of thinking or actual reality that when I was in a place, I was I was being followed because I was, uh, you know, a risk of, of stealing something. And I started thinking like, well, Is that a real experience or lived? And I got to ask that question, and I got a lot of people going, the only reason you would ask that is because you look the way that you do. And then because they were friends, I got to say, tell me more about that, because I want to understand this. I don't want to have just sort of this talking point of what racism is. I I don't want to have a talking point of what poverty and trauma is. I want to know, you know, mixed with my own experience of being a grandson of an immigrant and a you know, pig farmer, like I have this dichotomy of background. And then I have the fact that I'm a theoretical mathematician, uh, but I know how to lay fence and build pole barns, like help that person understand this, because that's sort of the raw material sitting in front of you. And what I learned was that I have to listen more, pay attention, ask hard questions, Be okay with the fact that you are regarded based on your own race in situations where you're trying to learn about race. How big a variable now is this new education you got firsthand from your friends about culture and everything? And how did it shape the way you approach educating kids? Yes, that's a that's a cool question. So what I came to through lots of experience and conversation was something that I don't I don't ever get fought on this, but I don't hear anybody else saying it. I learned that in low-density rural areas that are diverse, like what I was seeing in North Carolina and Texas, you have the same culture in a poor, predominantly white farm community that I would see here in in Hawville, which is predominantly African-American and Latinx. So as I was looking through my own lenses of those types of backgrounds that I described with, you know, an immigrant Slovenian background, and uh, which is what Burkhope's is, 
and then my mother's side of, of farmers and um, hog farmers and uh, several generations, I started thinking of the idea of a picnic table and what it meant when I was in Inglewood in Chicago with mostly African-American neighbors and what it meant to those poor white communities. And it meant the same thing. The common ground are the basic needs of human beings, right? So we want to have our basic needs met. Have we ever thought about creating a society or an education system that meets those basic needs as the way that we, are, we have created it? Uh, the answer is no, I think. If we were going to pay attention to the basic needs of a kid that's in a rural school district compared to a kid in a high density, those basic needs actually aren't very different, though their environment is different. So you would create different experiences. You'd never teach a kid in Whitestown or Zionsville who has basic needs that have a, a, a formula of a very different, though the same core tenets. You wouldn't try to teach them the same way you'd teach a kid in Christmas Addicts here in IBS. Uh, you wouldn't give them the same experiences to help them with the ultimate goal of living a well-lived life. So the picnic table is the same because humans want the same basic things, but the access to those is very different. Therefore, we have to create different experiences to be able to get them to that well-lived life, which should be our goal. Not that you can do your math fast. So let's frame it up as a mathematical problem, then. We'll, we'll stay right in your sweet spot. <laughs> okay. Tell me the key variables that you thought were at least controllable or adjustable as we think about completely redoing the STEM education and, and what would work for a Crispus Attic student here in Indianapolis or somewhere else. What's the variables, the key variables or the levers that we can move around to change the outcome? The, the current frame, the current formula, if we want to stick with that, is that we have a certain type of content or experience that we want people to learn. So we have standards, we have all these different things. The mechanism that we use to deploy uh, both the logistics of having 700 young people in one building every day and to be able to do productive things with those kids that are at varying levels of not yet we have to have the logistics of being able to get them to learn things and also keep everybody from <laughs> hurting each other and everything else, right? The way we've chosen to do that in the past is that we have to have an expert in the room to learn something. Expert is a classroom teacher that's been trained on some content. And the, the basic accreditations are at the K-12 through level, it's some sort of bachelor's degree uh, plus some, some training. Higher ed is usually a master's degree when you're at sort of the community college level. That's that, that kind of tier of, of um, capability. And then the university is a, mi a mix of ma master's and PhD. So the underlying premise is that you have to have a, an expert in the room to learn something. With the advent of technology, we democratized knowledge. The Internet democratized our ability to gain access to information. Now, it's not all good information, but now we don't have to have a single access point to understanding what math is because all you have to do is Google and you can find 10,000 hits on what you're trying to learn delivered by people in 10,000 different languages uh, through video, paper, you name it. You get all of these experiences. So the underlying premise that came before was Irregardless of where we were at, we had to logistically maintain a huge population of young people. And then we had to have single access points to knowledge that was well-trained. Well, we never achieved that. So we never got a great teacher in every classroom. That never works. And the form that we used with that being lecture also never worked. So we now know that people hear, what, 30, 35% of what we say, right? If you're not engaged in a conversation, but more being passively and listening. If that's the case, then that's, that is a non-optimal way of using 55 minutes, where a teacher thinks that, I, why, don't, why don't they get this? I said it, right? And then I said it on Wednesday, and I said it on Thursday. Well, that's because lecture doesn't work. So we don't need an ex expert as a single access point. Frankly, the experts as single access points, maybe they're a content expert, but most PhDs that I know have never been trained to teach. 
what are we trying to do in the classroom with kids? It's a completely and totally false claim that having a research mathematician in a room teaching kids college algebra is the best person to do that. Uh, their content knowledge is so far beyond college algebra that they frankly haven't taken something like that or even thought about how to factor a trinomial since they were 14. So we're basing a professional knowledge of how to execute something that we're not trained in based on what we learned when we were 14. No other profession does that. So from the sage on the stage sort of disseminating acquired knowledge on high down to the... Yeah, part, go in peace. Right, right. Use right. Your knowledge. You, 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 you now have, have heard from, from the mountaintop the expert, right? Yes. This is, this is the way to do this, and it's my way, or you don't... You and and they're accredited, and they've got initials after their name, and, yeah, very and that's, it's awesome. <laughs> but we know that doesn't work, and that's what work. you're saying firsthand. So give me the job description of what the problem you're trying to solve needs. So what are the core skill sets of a good educator? I don't think content knowledge is number one, especially now that we've democratized knowledge. So if we're going to look differently, what do we look for? We look for intangibles. Can you run small groups? Do people like you? That's useful. We don't learn from people we don't like. Do you have good communication skills? Are you empathetic? Can you connect with your students and others? If you think about those skill sets, who is the best educator for a 14-year-old? Well, if you talk about who can a 14-year-old really talk to very easily? Who do they connect with really easily? Who do they have shared life experiences with? And who do they most likely look like to a certain extent because we learn well from others that look like us? Well, it's another 14-year-old in your same school right now. If that's true, and I can argue enough that that core skill set is more important than some higher-powered knowledge, right? some higher-powered uh, math skill, then we should think that peer learning is vital to the experience of educating at, at mass at scale. You augment it with all the other tools that technology brings, and I think you've got this real uh, powerful thing. Why persist with this model? Well, it's because everybody still thinks that you need to have stuff like talked to kids, and that's how logistically you have to deal with it. Well, they're not motivated. Well, no one wants to sit for 55 minutes and listen to somebody drone on. You couldn't pay me to do that, right? So why do we have the expectation that a kid's going to do it for them? Well, we teach them, well, it's good for you. Well, that's selfish. Well, they don't want to just do things that are good for them. It's not how we're wired. So we learn most from teaching. No one has ever fought me on that. And it feels good to serve others. No one has ever fought me on that. We do not do that at all in our education system and capitalize on those two truths. Couldn't we do it differently if we just removed this, which says that we have to have an adult in the room that's been classically trained in some content, which frankly, they haven't been classically trained. They just carry a, a degree and they don't know how to educate because we don't teach people how to educate in practical ways. Or we have these variables, which are young people can connect, empathize, have shared language, shared cultural experiences and time-framed experiences. And then we train them to capitalize on that learning's better. Learning and from teaching is very good and very powerful, and then serving others brings you joy. Those are the two options that I've, uh, I see as available. We could use the same system that is set up. We just have to remove the idea that lecture is vital and that time, 16 weeks to learn something, right? That's what we do to kids. Take those out and let peers work with each other in vital and important ways while, while training them, and you You've got a one-to-one -one so, swap. So we're going to keep a classroom. Absolutely. Why not? We're going to keep a 50-minute time frame. Sure. Those variables don't change. But we're going to shift, it sounds like, a variable from a lecturer, knowledge expert, to an adult facilitator who's going to create the learning environment and, and make sure that people are still, you know, being respectful of each other, et cetera. But then you're adding this new variable of the peer facilitator, instructor, coach, yep. 
that's coming in to make learning relatable one-on-one. So now I've got somebody who's somebody I know who's a lot like me, who's only maybe one chapter ahead of me, so to speak, but they know it well enough to help me get to where they are. And then we keep kind of belaying, like climbing a mountain together. They go up a little higher, then I go up a little higher, and suddenly we're climbing this mountain of education and making math work together. Together is the most important part of that. Also, uh, I said it earlier, uh, we don't recursively elaborate what we've learned previously in the current system. It's discrete courses built in a, you know, forward assembly line way. What you take as an eighth grader, you only return to because the first couple of chapters of most books are like this review. Well, the reason they're a review is because they've forgotten it. And then now you're, you're, you're sort of trying to do that while teaching a whole new content. If you're a just beyond peer and you're going back and teaching what you learned in fourth grade and you're in eighth grade, you're relearning fourth grade through an eighth grade lens, which makes a whole bunch more connections, neural connections, makes it a much more robust conceptual understanding of content. Because to teach a young novice, you have to unpack what you think you know. You have to ask questions like, well, why can't I divide by zero? Huh, I never really cared. When I was doing it, it was just, you can't. Well, now I have to, because this kid's looking at me and asking me why I can't, I actually have to come up with an answer. And Kevin told me that I'm not allowed to ever say because it's always been that way, because it hasn't. This stuff's all invented. There's no such thing as it's always been that way, so you better come up with a better answer. And then we, we start to unpack things and recursively elaborate through educating. And then we also build the capacity that that fourth grader idolizes that eighth grader. We never use that as an advantage in our our cultural systems. They want peers that are just beyond, that they can look up to and see themselves on a three-year jump. It is so powerful and so human to have that. We don't use it. We don't use it to our advantage at all. Uh, Just like we don't use that teaching is the best way to learn and that peers can connect. I I don't understand why those levers we don't pull. Walk me through what a classroom experience in this new collaborative environment and community space would look like. So if you have a big big of a system as an education system, you can't, it's not pragmatic to say, I'm just going to disband this thing, throw it to the side, and let's build a new. So the Learning Commons model was built around the idea that we can plug into the current system and impact change from the inside. And then we're shifting towards a long-term goal. So I'll speak immediately. What does it look like in a blended learning environment experience? So what we do in our schools right now, we've got as young as 8-year-olds, and we have as old as 58-year-olds teaching at Ivy Techs, all in in learning commons and peer collaborative environments. So as young as 8-year-olds, we have a K-8 through model where the learning commons is built into the schools, the hub or the nexus point for that peer collaboration. That's where we train them. It's their home. It's also an environment where all the other experiences of that school, be it instructional assistance, um, outside programs like School on Wheels, these other programs, now they have a place where they can all hang out that feels wonderful and they can execute their programming. Then we satellite out into the classrooms and we help build learning environments and blended learning environments in that teacher's classroom. So Miss Smith gets three peers and a learning commons director that comes to her math class on Tuesdays and helps her because she needs help and she knows it. She doesn't have to shoulder this burden on her own anymore. And that's what we've been telling teachers for a generation now is that when you lock that door and you've got those 35 kids, you might as well keep them on your back because it's your job to get them through it. You keep, that will never work. So we satellite out. We build blended learning environments in the classroom with the teachers. Uh, we have a learning commons in the school that's active to where they can send you know, 10 kids down for the last 15 minutes of class and we can interact. Um, maybe the, the very beginning of the class, the kids start down there. Maybe Miss Smith brings her whole class on Thursdays and is in the Learning Commons with my full-time director who runs that space. And then maybe there's seven kids that are in there that are helping her with her 15 to 35 kids. You get it down to a one to three, and anybody can learn anything. Uh, We've proved that since the mid-'80s with Bloom's work, is uh, well-trained tutors 
with a low ratio of 2 to 2, 2t. Two Anybody can learn anything at a 2 sigma compared to average. So two full uh, standard deviations above the average, which is like the 98th percentile, right? If that's true, then Bloom lamented and so did everybody else. Well, how do we afford this? Well, we're raising our hands and saying, here's how. Use the students in your school as that workforce of affordability and scalability. And so what we would see then is uh, a room like what we're in right now, or some version of it in the school. Yep. And so we've got two fourth graders and maybe an eighth grader or a sixth grader at this table with erasable markers doing, instead of doing just a worksheet over and over and over again by rote, they're, they're building the building blocks of understanding on this table and marking it out and redoing it and redoing it together. Yeah, and they're talking about it, and they're which talking is really important, it. right? Right. They're talking about how to do things. They're using their own language to do that, which to an outsider, we would say, well, they have to be on task and they have to do this and that. Stop. Adults are getting in the way of kids excelling because we think we have to control everything. Let them be kids around content and watch how powerful it is. I, I said this recently. I had a, a principal here in Indianapolis that I was talking to and uh, he said, you know, my, my kids can't teach each other. They're so far behind. They're, you know, they can't behave. They can't, they can't, they can't, they can't. They can't teach each other. And that solidified something for me that the problem is, and you know, there's a lot of, you know, standardized religions that have this sort of like be childlike. Well, here's what that means to me. The adults are the problem. We get in the way of kids being wonderful, beautiful, experienced, because we heap on them all of the things that we have learned incorrectly, and sometimes the truths about how society and equities work. But when we say that an, a 14-year-old can't teach another 14-year-old, that's insane. Yes, they can. They're teaching them everything else. Watch your 7-year-old teach your 4-year-old. Watch your 4-year-old idolize that older sibling and mimic their entire behaviors and tell me that kids can't teach each other. That capacity is there and it's extremely powerful. It's our job to train them to be effective. Adults are the problem, right? Build an initial model that works into the system. It plugs into higher ed as it stands, which I have a big problem with, but it's a billion dollar industry. Plugs into K through 12 as it stands. Give me a classroom. Give me a media center. Give me a place that used to store books. You know, we can build a learning commons. What do we move towards? Well, we move towards an entire school that's not designed for discrete classrooms based on that old premise of a knowledgeable other. And now we build schools for handling the logistics of peer learning, but also other blended, right? So, what about individualized learning where you can take your headphones and plug into, you know, adaptive learning software and have an experience there? What about peer to peer? How do we handle that with large groups of kids like what we were doing at IUPUI where we had 600 visits a day? Well, you need big spaces and you need to control volume and, and design with architecture and, and, uh, and space that experience. And then you need to think about these questions as we move this system further. Why isn't there a dentist at school? Why isn't there health care at school? What about a grocery store? Can we have grocery stores at school? When I go to a small town and I look at a heat map of density for population, that small town's density heats up at school where four to 500 people are in a city of 2,000 at one time, eight hours a day. Shouldn't that be the center of commerce and experience and, you know, human experience for that small town? And it could be the same in this neighborhood, right, in, in a, uh, the 12th largest city in the U.S. Shouldn't school be something much more than just where we send our kids to get free babysitting? And so where we're shifting the system now is prove that peer learning is working. But then build something that we're calling a community commons, which we're going to break ground on in February of 2020 where we answered the questions about why isn't there a dentist at school? Well, there is now. What about a healthcare clinic? Well, we're putting one in the building. What about a grocery store? Well, we had to redesign the whole idea of a grocery store, 
right? Should be built for distribution. We don't need to walk aisles and pick soup cans off the, the shelves. Put those in the back in an Amazon style. Pack people's stuff and put it in their cars. What about a food experience? Can I show up and you cook me something uh, real quick that's healthy? Because convenience is often what food deserts sort of wrap around, right? That's why the gas station is the most expensive and uh, highest used access to terrible food in low-resource communities. Just walk them in the morning. Everybody goes to the gas station to get a pop and a bag of chips or some donuts because that's where food is. Grocery stores don't persist because low-resource communities are not built to sustain a grocery store where you walk aisles. So if we put all that into a building and create a user experience that thinks about the basic needs of a human being, can we redefine how a building with young people, because we have a, a skilled trades high school that we're building into this building, and a middle school designed around a learning commons model, that's 70,000 square foot of something completely different. And what if we built that $15 million building right into a neighborhood that is the lowest resource neighborhood of a major city? What would happen? Well, we're going to find out because we're doing it. Where are you building it? Right next to Havel Library uh, on the west side of, of Indianapolis. The same community that my grandfather immigrated to is where we're going to build that first one. And we're going to serve the community because this is my community. I'm not doing anything to any community. This is where I'm from. Uh, so all of my community members and everyone else, we're building something that is a completely different approach to this system because we started with plugins. Now we're moving to something that gives you a model that says this could be a better way. And then we have to prove that it works. Uh, there's a lot of risk in that. When, when was it slated to, to open? Let's see. It'll be a roughly 12-month build. So it'll take um, through all of 2020 with construction. And then uh, August of 2021, the schools will all start up and the building will be done. How many students can it accommodate? We're looking at, I think, probably around 500, 550 for the first building. It'll be a skilled trades high school with a 3-2 environment. So the kids are working jobs and uh, learning skilled trades for three days a week. And two days they're back in our building. We wanted to build a building that was sort of the, the pinnacle of, of a learning environment with new lighting and natural lighting and glass and, you know, the whiteboard, everything uh, experience, and then give it to the lowest resource students of an entire community and see what kind of a statement that would make and what capacities they have that we would unearth through giving them access to those resources. That's the vision. Um, we've been working on that model for three years and as we got closer and closer to construction, more and more people jumped in, and we were asked to put together a business model to do that a thousand more times. So what's it like to build those everywhere? And what can we do with 5G and high-speed internet and high-capacity compute with other partners? Could we Wi-Fi whole neighborhoods? Could we have that this is a five-story building in the middle of a community that typically is three one-houses, and then could we put a 5G tower on top of it and offer sort of a utility experience for, for Internet? I think the answer is yes. I'm not doing that all. I have great partners. Um, I know my lanes. I bring teams together, and we have some really neat things that we're doing as a team, but we bring a lot of partners to the table because we, we need that. Speaking of that, you've created a constellation of companies to help make this vision a reality. Why don't you kind of walk us through everything you're involved in? I was always inundated with information that if you do everything, you don't do anything well. Well, if you're trying to disband a human system and other metaphors like boil an ocean, then you have to do everything. So we started with one business that was professional services. It built learning commons and had some, some software that it was using to execute that program. And then we got funded by the world's largest foundation, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they said, well, we don't usually invest in for-profits because I'm a firm believer in the power of, of execution and, and, and capitalism and, and being able to drive impact. And so I started as a for-profit. And when they told me that, I segregated the companies into Crossroads Education, which is a 501c3, and Crossroads Tech, which sells the software. 
Those sister companies now work together on strategy. I can raise venture capital money here. I can raise philanthropic money here. Both are sort of the same. Uh, that you just kind of give up certain things in terms of restricted and unrestricted uh, uses of cash. Everybody needs cash to be able to deploy programming, and uh, everybody has cash flow problems. And then we got farther and farther along, and we had clients like Vanguard Collegian of Indianapolis over on 14th and Mount. And you, you go up to and you drive up to the school, and it's a 115-year-old building, and there's bars on the windows. There's boilers breaking and drop ceilings from the 1950s and Schedule two tile on the floor that's been polished 450,000 times. They still heat it with antiquated you know, versions of boiler systems, and they still cool it with window inserts. And then these kids are in a learning commons environment with their, their school leaders who are trying to do epic things, and the facility is 70 years behind what they need. And that was the day leading up to that where I sat with a group of community members and I said, make me a list of why I can't build a building that does all of this stuff. That birthed eventually after going through that list, finding construction partners like Arco Design Build and you know development partners and these other groups, IFF and LISC and all these other community members. And Crossroads Realty Group was born out of that, that we needed facilities. And I had a whole bunch of people come to me and go to meetings with developers to help me sound less silly because uh, I didn't know anything about building buildings. I knew we needed them. And then, you know, years later, now I know a lot about building buildings, right, because we're about to launch a massive one. But I have all these partners still at the table along the way. So those three companies work together with facilities, design, programming, software, and the software continues to expand in its portfolio of offerings as an augmentation to everything else. And then I had an apprenticeship, because I believe in the power of that, that I spun out of the university called the Dev Shop. And we were just building software for, for companies and everything else. And EduSource is a company that had a great founder team and people that are extremely thoughtful and good at what they do. And I saw the potential of marrying their ability to manage and grow and run that, that thing that I was doing over here with an apprenticeship. And we married them together this year. They bought out my apprenticeship and we joined that team together. Now I have a management group uh, very talented people that have layered accountability built into how we take young people and skill them up fast. And that's one more tool that these companies that are trying to develop the, the peer capacity to teach and now facilities and software, which I need talent for building software. Well, now I've got an apprenticeship to feed them and the rest of the community. They all work together in one ecosystem, which is what we build. If you have the capacity to collaborate and partner there's more that you could ever get done than trying to do it all on your own. I want to do it all, so I need really good partners. So each of these entities has a management team and a really great team that are running and operating and grinding uh, where we're headed together. Without those teams, we'd, we'd be nowhere. We'd be not doing the great work that we're doing. So let me just summarize for the listener at this point. What I'm hearing you tell me is, the variable that's kind of sort of the same is the raw material between a 14-year-old's ears. That doesn't really change that much regardless of the student's background and everything else. The raw material's there. Now, some people have a lot of sort of, we'll call it negative, for lack of a better word, influencers on their formula with under-resources, poverty, trauma, all those things. So that that's that's on that other side of the equation. You think, and you're pretty confident, you can offset all of that, at least in part or substantially, by going into this peer collaborative system where the focus is not on memorization, but the focus is on application and real learning. Yeah, it, growth. What did I miss? No, I think you had it. I don't just think. We've proved it. Uh, I've been doing this since 2012. That's when I built the first ones. We've been researching it over the last 10, 8, 10 years. I know it works at the higher ed level. I know that kids use it at a rate that is unheard of uh, compared to other centers that do you know, peer collaboration like tutoring centers or su supplemental instruction or uh, these others. We had 
We had 90% of underrepresented minorities at IUPUI using this facility that were taking the courses that we were teaching. We had 60% of the whole student body using it. We had 600 visits a day. We had 110,000 visits in an academic year. Like, that's the busiest place on campus other than when there's food or beer, right? And then we knew in the high school when we started getting the outputs that young people were teaching each other, or 92% of the school was... Uh, had used the facility within the first four months and that the kids that we hired had never passed a standardized test in their life, but they were delivering great product. And then they all passed. They all went to college. Um, they were teaching each other calculus when calculus wasn't even what they were supposed to be learning. So we, we, we've known all along the way because I can't just build something that feels good. If you put a bunch of kids in a room, it, it inspires people. You walk in, you see them working together and I mean, it makes you tear up because it's just beautiful. It can't just be that. It has to be rigorously analyzed to see what are the metrics for success. Are we obtaining them? The answer is no, because we're rigorously testing this thing. Where, where can I optimize this? How can I get better at that? Now we have a great program that we know works, but we're constantly hard on ourselves, right? We're not throwing parties when Bill and Melinda Gates uh, funds us. We are trying to figure out how do I take what I don't know today and figure it out. And then now we're this business that is in schools as a partner, delivering core content, running math departments, doing all these different things. I don't know anybody else that's doing that. So we have this unbelievable access and opportunity that we can't screw up because we fought to get that opportunity. And now we know this works. We just have to get everybody else to get out of the out of the way of their own, you know, sort of progress, right? And it's, it's happening. Uh, there's a momentum that's shifting that's it's very inspiring, but also hard because sales cycles are tough and people cost money and training takes time and invoicing schools is, is difficult and people want to give money to venture investments where they get a return on investment that is, you know, a 10x of their... We're never going to be able to offer that. We could be all over the country and still not give you what it was like to, to get at the ground level of Salesforce, right? So th these are all things that are, I guess, a, a roundabout way of saying we actually we know it works. What's been the feedback from teachers unions and from administrations? So I told my team at the very beginning that we have to make sure that we're really good at helping community understand that we're not anti-teacher with this model because we're not. We're, we're teachers' biggest fans. We're bringing an army to support them. What we are is anti-long-term sub. We're anti-teacher vacancy. Classroom teachers are our favorite people, so we want to support them. And we've constantly had conversations with the teachers' unions to help them understand that, that we're here to help and change the narrative of you know, teachers deserve to be paid more. Well, they can be paid more if there's another part of the system that is a cheaper, lighter student population. One teacher labor cost can pay 25 to 30 students. We can have an army of kids to support a more high-powered teacher system. Administrators are, I think, extremely appreciative when the environment is such that they are recognizing that they need to change things. We have not been well received by the nature of this renders an old method obsolete. And some people have built their careers on the old method. And that scares people. And I, I get that. I don't believe that would ever stop me from doing what we're doing. But I understand, right? So when, when it, I can employ 155 undergraduates and it costs less than five faculty members, I could see why faculty members would be a little upset with me. Because this renders your model of being a ivory tower knowledgeable other that gets paid quite well and only works eight to ten months out of the year, that whole thing is imploding. And now you've got a model that shows everybody that there's a better way. That's terrifying. But we need it. And everybody knows it. So do you give up when you start getting all of what humans do to people that are trying to innovate? No. Do you get tired? Yeah. Tell me about the critics. What, what do they say, and what's your answer to them? Oh, they say things like, you're, you're, you're hurting rigor. I hear that all the time. 
especially at the university level. Well, if a professor isn't teaching it, then it's, it's not rigorous. Well, 70% of the kids fail a math class. What part of that is rigor? Well, we are we're lowering, the, lowering the expectations. Okay, no, I'm actually providing more resources for more people to be successful. Any metric that has ever been put in front of us for success, passing a standardized test, passing an exam, a final exam, we've shown that when people collaborate and learn together, that they can do better on that assessment. If they keep throwing those sorts of things, rigor and, you know, we have to control curriculum, okay, what you're really telling me is that this is your last-ditch effort to hold on to the old way. And we can't change our way of operating because you want to hold on to something that doesn't work and likely never did. That's not well received, but it's part of this burden of disbanding big human systems that we've taken on, not me, but a team. And they know what it's like to do this really positive, extremely fulfilling work and then get absolutely criticized and chastised by people that should know better. But uh, that's part of it. So we've put together this winning formula. We've got these wonderful collaborative learning spaces and learning centers in, in the school. And now we're getting students that are actually capable of doing college-level work and beyond, and they actually enjoy it. They like it. Tell me the success story. Make it real. Give me an avatar of a kid that you saw personally, and, and tell me that success story. Well, we've got a lot of them. So I'll start young. We had a young man who was in fourth grade, and this is over a year ago now, who could not read. And the general understanding is, you know, this kid's been kicked out of school a lot, travels a lot, transient population, which is very typical. Uh, in low-resource communities, you sort of go where you can live, if you have parents, that is. And... So we, we had sort of this meeting about this kid, and, and the idea was, what do we do with him? Well, the traditional way to what you do with him is you kick him out of school, right? Go, it's somebody else's problem. Well, that doesn't help the kid. It does help the 80 other kids that he was potentially disrupting, but that's like sacrificing one for many, right? Which we've been doing for years, and the ones that typically get sacrificed inequitably are split. Okay, so if that's the case then what if we went to that kid like we did and said, you're a teacher now? And the first thing out of his mouth is, I can't read, because we were asking him to teach literacy uh, and reading to kindergartners. And that's a great reaction. And we, we tell him, no, that's not a problem. What we need you to do is to teach this letter alphabet game to kindergartners. So you're going to have to build it. We're going to help you. But you won't go to math class for the next two weeks. You're going to make this game and prepare to teach those kindergartners. The math teacher was thrilled because the young man was no longer in her class causing problems. Even if it's a two-week reprieve, that was glorious for her. So he built a game for two weeks, practiced delivering that game to five-year-olds, and then he went and he started teaching them. And he was phenomenal at it. When you give somebody that doesn't have purpose, purpose and hope and confidence their entire being changes. And so we saw a kid that was expelled from every school he'd ever been in, was fourth grader, which is, you know, nine years old, couldn't read, teaching young kids the alphabet. And they were learning. And they loved him because he's, you know, this good-looking, uh, big, strong kid, and they're five-year-olds, right? They idolized him. And he was kind to them and gentle as we typically are when we're responsible for someone else, not just ourselves. And then not too long after that, he started reading. And we took a kid that in the first four to five years of his education experience, we did nothing but get rid of him and tell him he wasn't good enough and gave him one different opportunity. And then now he has not been kicked out of the school that he's been in since we started working with him. And he is caught up uh, on the things that he's behind. He's a, it's a miracle. Not really. It's just we used an asset in a different way because those kids are an asset to that school. It's just we haven't figured out how to wield that, that lever. Another story would be kid, young African-American boy, 14, 
uh, he went from boy to man in about six months because he grew about six inches and his voice jumped about three octaves down in literally six months. And this kid was the first hire, male hire, that we had as a tutor in high school several years ago. It's been three years now. And his grades were terrible-ish, you know, C's and D's, a couple A's sprinkled in there. But when you met him, you knew how smart he was, right? Because you can see and sort and so, well, I can. Uh, I'll speak for myself. I can sense intellect. And you can sense it in, in certain ways. Uh, maybe it's just something that it's an antenna that I have that I can sense. So I sensed intellect in the kid, and I said, I want to hire him. When we sat down, we were doing our hiring. Everybody's like, what? No. And then my team members, who have the same sort of sensibility about these things, was like, yeah, we should hire that kid. He's going to be phenomenal. So he had the intangibles. People like him. He's charismatic. He could probably sell you just about anything. Man, that's a great teacher. He started teaching and excelled at it. His grades turned around. He grew six inches, so he was on the basketball team. He went to play on the varsity team. His sense of self was continuing to expand and increase. And then one day I walked in, and he had a book open, and it was, it was a big, thick book. And I'm like, what's this kid doing? And we had a good relationship, so I got a chance to talk to him. And I said, what are you doing? Well, I'm studying calculus. Well, first of all, he's a sophomore. He didn't even be looking at calculus. He needs to be studying Algebra 2 or Geometry because that's the course levels that he's in. And I said, well, what are you doing that for? I said, you're not taking any calculus courses. He said, we, we don't have any teachers in calculus in this school. If we don't learn this, who else is going to teach each other? I thought, huh, yeah, we're on to something. They are taking ownership on their own because we're giving them the chance to. When I actually said, you don't need to be studying algebra and inner reflection, I got in his way for just a second, right? Because I said, well, that's, that's not necessary yet, because me as an adult obviously knows everything. And then as soon as he explains himself, I'm like, I was wrong. Please keep studying in calculus. Can I help you? Because you're right. You are the only one that is going to do that. And that's the core of what we're doing. There's no one that is better situated to impact and help thrive the community that you were born in than you who knows it from the inside out and understands that it's not about education to get out. The only people that are preaching that are people that weren't there in the first place. So education isn't about getting out. It's about empowering yourself with the right skill sets to improve your own community because you are the only one that's going to. And if you build that capacity in young people who haven't had access and capacity, what we're going to do is start asking a whole bunch of different questions, like, why didn't we do this before? And isn't it absurd that kids 10 years ago weren't teaching in schools? We'll start saying that. And that's what we're working towards. What kind of student were you going through the system? So school was easy in terms of grades. I had a lot of, of uh, really good friends in the early grades, uh, but was always in trouble. And you went to school here in Indianapolis? Yep. So started uh, on the south side and then went so midway through sort of my adolescence out to the suburb of Plainfield. I was in trouble all the time because of my probably underlying capacity to be bored pushed me to do other things, but also... I didn't exist well in an environment where I had to sit and passively engage with something that I wasn't sure was good. And uh, I remember that as a very, very young kid sitting in a classroom thinking, you know, I'm going to get the grades that I need because that stuff's easy. Well, why am I doing this? And I think that persisted. I thought all along the way that eventually I would have been proved that this was system made sense. Right, So you get into high school and you're like, okay, you've got these things that you've been working towards. Surely the teachers there will be brilliant and you'll be exposed. And then there were some brilliant ones that I could name from my experience. But on the whole, no. And then I got to undergrad and my cousin had told me, college is this land of the ultimate you know, education experience, right? the bastion of knowledge. And he went to IU for a year and dropped out and joined the military. So I got to university and started being in, in Purdue as a top 20, top 25 
uh, math department. And I was in math classes with like professors that are world renowned, supposedly. And I was like, surely this is where brilliance lies. And then you sit in there and they tell you, well, we're having you compete against each other. And only a certain number of you will get A's. And only a certain number of you will get B's. And here's, here's the, what you have to learn. And I had to show up to lecture where you could tell the dude had just written down stuff on a piece of paper before he showed up. And I was like, hmm, that's a letdown. And a master's degree at University of Texas. Surely this is the level, right? Everybody's been weeded out. Not very many people get to a master's degree in mathematics, nonetheless, which is supposed to be extremely hard. Studying things like graph theory and knot theory and, and machine learning, surely at a top 15 school like the University of Texas in Austin, this is where brilliance is. This is where it's a highly executed design for what it means to learn. No. Then you get to a PhD. Why do I want a PhD? Well, I'm going to be knocking on doors where letters matter. I didn't want to get a PhD. I didn't want to be let down one more time that the system didn't make sense. And then I got into classes where I'm reading two or three books a week and I show up and I'm overprepared because everybody else shows up and they have no idea what they're talking about. I'm like, okay, well... So every step along the way, everything that I learned was outside of the classroom on my own or with peer sets and friends. Okay. So now I at least persisted long enough to get all the way through a PhD to understand that the whole system's broken. <laughs> I got that box checked. People call me doctor. Great. Don't care. But I do get to go into rooms where I have letters behind my name because of that persistence with an armed capacity to say, there's a better way and we've been working on it for a while. I tried your way. I was really good at it. Got $20 million in grants while I was a researcher from some of the top institutions in the world. I know how to play that game. It doesn't work. So let's do something else with the understanding that I don't want a kid to go through my system that goes, surely when I get past this stage, right? So I'm motivated by my own... Uh, Ridiculousness, I suppose. But uh, I'd, I'd very much like for young people to have experiences where they get to it and they go, man, this really works. I'm, I really feel good about this. And I feel good about myself. I feel good about where I'm headed. If we can do that, we've, we've done something special. This problem you're taking on is a monster. And change is slow and, and it's resisted. Yet... You get up every day and do that. Where, where do you find that inner drive day in and day out, even on your tough days, to come back to the near west side of Indianapolis and roll your sleeves up and have at it one more day? Uh, it's not easy. Uh, I'm extremely passionate about the people that work with me and the teams that we've built and the programs that we're deploying. The joy that you see drives you the inequities that you see in the in, in justice. It is a big problem. Here's what I think. The kids that are growing up now have learned to share rides and other things through the technology use like Uber and Lyft and you know Airbnb. They've learned that the share economy is possible, and that used to terrify people. They're growing up on that capacity. My job and my generation's job is to build the roads and bridges to get them to an education system that they can then deploy. So I'm, I'm an infrastructure guy. I'm going out and I'm, I'm doing all the hard fights. I'm clearing pathways and laying down gigantic highways and bridges so that we can then, with that young leadership that comes up, they can deploy the actual full change in model. It's going to take a generation. So my kids are seven, four, and two. Their generation is the one that I think will deploy this. With us laying the infrastructure now, but also with us teaching them of why they need to do that. That's the mistake that I've been told with a lot of my friends of the, the civil rights movement, is that we assume that if we fought for something that the next generation would get it. You have to teach them. That's, that's the two-pronged approach. I'm a bridge layer, um, but then I'm an educator of why this is so important and why it is your job to think of yourself as an educator and that you cannot rise unless your community rises with you. What's been the biggest surprise that you've come across as you've started this journey? 
Uh, I'll say something that exposes me as being blissfully ignorant. I didn't know how hard people would fight me. Uh, I thought if you created a pragmatic program that really worked and executed at a high level and had great results, that people would welcome you with like open arms. That is not the case. And I was shocked when that really started to be heaped on me. Criticism, you know, personal attacks, professional attacks. It just floored me, and I should have known better. But I suppose sometimes that blissful ignorance and uh, believing that humans are capable of doing redeemable, wonderful good is not a bad thing to carry. <laughs> maybe there's somebody that's been listening all this time to our conversation today, and maybe education's not their problem, but they've got something else. What advice would you give to them if you could give them one piece, one nugget to challenge them to take on whatever problem is theirs to try to solve? So I think two things I'd like to say. One is if, if you see the same things that we have talked about in education, there is a pathway to you helping. Uh, we're spreading. We are scaling. If you think this belongs in your school or your children deserve to have this experience, then go to your school districts and tell them because the, the real power in our education system lies with the families. And what we demand, we want teachers to demand for this and we want parents to demand for this. That will create change. If you have your own problem, your own path and, and something that you're passionate about that you're trying to solve, you need to arm yourself with all of the capacity that is needed to achieve that goal. So you need to educate yourself. You need to know everything and anything. You need to be strong enough to ask really hard questions about yourself and about what you're trying to accomplish. Then you need to find out and figure out how to network with people that know things about this, but also network with people that will be able to give you access to resources and capacity that you'll need should you find success enough to get to that level. You need government, you need policy, you need resource, you need capital, you need all of these things. You should be networking in a way where it's a constant nine to five building your ecosystem of partners and network and understanding, and then pragmatically build a model that is scalable and practical and that people can easily understand. If you can build those, you can solve those problems, but you will quickly figure out that the most important thing that you did was that networking of all of those people, those champions that are quietly championing your cause or your you know, your program, your model, because they're out there talking right now, even though you don't know it. And uh, those evangelists are what will keep you from being unsuccessful or give you the pathway to success. And it has little to do with you, really. What's the one thing you hope somebody takes away from our conversation today? I think it's the simple truth that the biggest thing that we're doing right now in society is getting in our young people's way. It's the adult's problem not theirs. And we need to fix that at scale. And then we also need to understand that to parent and raise children is extremely hard to do well. So we need to no longer think that it's the parent's job to raise that tiny human only. It's the community's job to raise all of the children. We should do it together and we should do it thoughtfully and we should do it in an optimized way where we, we benefit from each of our own shortcomings and capacities. I think that is really important. So what, what I'm hearing is if, if we invest in a community school ecosystem that can support not just education but the family through the education cycle, then we don't have to subsidize as many later when they're adults or we don't have to warehouse them through incarceration. So what you're describing is why I think that education is a health care issue. So preventative care works. This is preventative care. Healthcare issue, if you want to argue with me, here's why I base that premise. So if you don't graduate from high school, you live 10 years less on average than somebody that does. Okay, that's a healthcare issue. Healthcare and the social determinants of health are predictors for success in school. So if we frame this in a very different way, we can say that education is a healthcare issue, which means those two buckets should be together as a united front where we bring health care into the education system, and then we help families raise kids by investing in it, right? 
There, we should have centers where parents can drop their kids off and go on a date and not have to call grandma because parents need to hang out with each other. Or a parent whose car breaks down and they have no idea what they're going to do with their three kids, there should be a place where they could go and drop them off to have help with being a parent and also you know, a human. So that's really important is preventative maintenance works. If you frame this as a health care issue, which I think it is, then we would do all the uploaded, front-loaded work to have a well-lived life in the long run. Just reactively fixing problems at the end by building more jail cells is more expensive and does nothing other than continue to segregate society into haves and haves nots. We don't want to live in that society. We want to, we want to get closer to what we want to be, which is an inclusive society that has the capacity of joy and, and a well-lived life. I think people want that. I think we are suffering from an old frame of, of what co community and society should be based upon the just massive change that we now have this awakening of, of technology has democratized knowledge and, and, and access. So now we know things or we can quickly know things. And what I'm also taking from our conversation is if we can create a vibrant educational hub inside of a community, then we're not shipping kids out and teaching them that you have to leave the community for a good things that our community can't provide. We can use that as sort of the, the outpost for growth, revitalization, and everything that's going to happen around that community because now uh, kids are seeing, wait a second, I can be a force for good and a force for positive change. I just did in this fourth grader's life. Yeah, why not? Why can't we do that? Uh, I don't have a problem. I traveled the whole country, right? I don't have problems leaving where you grew up. I do have a problem with us saying that education is meant to get you out. That's not true. Your service to your community can start as early as eight-year-olds. We're already doing that. So let's frame it that way. Your childhood is growing up where you're being served by your community and you are serving it. We sort of have this like one-way track with that right now. So if you spent... 8 to 18, you spent 10 years serving your community, and then you wanted to go see other things, great. But you got the chance to serve that community in effective ways that were really useful to you to build skill sets, but also really useful to the four-year-olds that you were working with. If you go and you get an education outside of your community, and you framed it that your ability to learn more somewhere else should augment your capacity to come back and and should you have that value system to impact your community again, we need to talk that way. Because the only time people now go back is when they go to church or visit their mom on the weekends. Even if they educated themselves, their tax base is not impacting their community because they live somewhere else. What you give on Sunday isn't going to impact that community. That church or wherever you go to visit your mom and you still live on 24th and Harding, there's still 40% occupancy there, even though you're now making 180000 a year. So that frame is bizarre. Why not, why not think of service in a very different way as part of the well-lived life? I think it's where we're headed. Well, and it's community. It's doing life because you can put roots down with those same group of people and age together and the next generation pour into the next generation and pour into the next generation. We don't have to be economic nomads and transients and have no connection to anything which we took convenience. So technology started to build this level of convenience. Then we took convenience to mean isolation. And then we've isolated ourselves from our community. We sit in our house with our big screen TVs and we wonder why mental health is a horrifying thing right now in society. It's and loneliness. We're pack animals. We are 100% filled with joy when we serve others. Now, is it easy to get along with human beings all the time? No, I would never say that. It's hard, right? Humans have all sorts of quirks and wonderments about them. Serving others doesn't mean that they're your best friend and that you get along with them 99% of the time. Serving others is that you provide yourself with the shortest path of joy, which is you help someone else find what they need, find joy, find experience, you know, learn something, whatever. I'm not saying everybody's this utopia where everybody's like 
all of a sudden the greatest humans in the world and we're not yelling at each other and, and fighting. No, that will never happen because human beings are complex. But serving others is part of the way we operate and building community by the nature of the fact that we have kids for 40% of their wake life in school. Man, that's easy. That's low-hanging fruit. I don't even need a ladder, right, to get at that. So I think that's something that's attainable. And neighbors can meet around a picnic table and have a nice picnic in a summer day. Why not? Yeah. Right? Why not? I, I think the most important thing is to understand, you know, if you listen, I'm just a normal human being, came from a normal background. The things that I have achieved in my life that I've worked hard for is not something that anybody else couldn't obtain. I, I say this all the time when I'm working with young people. You know, I have a PhD. That doesn't mean I know everything. If I'm capable of obtaining that, so are you. That means that the capacity that lies within me is so close to the capacity that lies within you or anyone else that the only thing that it really requires is the ability to want it, work hard towards these goals, and continue moving in those directions. There's nothing special about what we're doing that other people couldn't work this hard to, to obtain goals and dreams. It just isn't. Uh, I blend to a, into a crowd really easily. So I, I think that should be something that people rest assured with, that my capacity to do the things that I'm doing is very, very close to everyone else's capacity. Uh, if you think differently, then try. And the one variable, though, in our equation that we've been working on through the conversation that I will give you credit for, it, it just... It's in everything that I'm hearing you talk about is the sub P, and I'll give it that, passion. And, and you definitely have a passion for what you're doing. And I imagine you can't imagine doing anything but this. No. No, there's no real other option for, for what I'm doing. It is difficult and hard, but the amount of joy in, in solving complex problems and working with incredibly talented teams and getting a chance to talk to people, yeah, I would, would do nothing else. At the end of this, many years from now, what would you define success? How would you say you won the race? Uh, I'm an infrastructure guy, right? So have we built the roads and bridges that make the next step possible? I don't have to have my name on schools and buildings. I have three goals. I need to be a good dad. I'm making mistakes towards that endeavor daily, but also doing an all right job. I need to be a good husband. I make epic mistakes towards that daily, though I'm trying. And I want to bring my talents and skill sets towards this vision of what we could do differently in society. Those are the threes that I'm hanging my hat on. None of those have anything to do with me and my name or all of that. It has to do with, will my children grow into happy, well-balanced humans? Will my marriage and my relationship with my partner persist and uh, grow and change as they typically do when two people meet uh, when they don't have a lot going on and then, then they do? And then uh, will these visions and, and programs persist enough to make the types of changes that shift something that needs shifting? If somebody wants to know more about the work that you're doing, what's a good place on the web for them to start finding you. So crossroadseducation.org is our website. I got this real lovely thing. So if you Google Kevin Burkopes, there's only one of me in the world because Burkopes is a very unique name. So you can read a lot about what we're up to by just looking me up and, and seeing all the teams and things that I get a chance to work with. But uh, crossroadseducation.org is a great place to start. That's the uh, kind of the mothership of all of this. And if there may be a member of the PTO and they would like to talk about beginning conversations to get a center like we're in embedded in their schools, is that a good place for them to start? Yeah. I mean, me personally contacting me is, is the shortest path to that. So we, we go to a lot of schools. We have a lot of conversations. We spend a lot of time in the community. I need parents to start demanding this. And so if a parent's demanding it, then that's the exact parent I want to talk to. Awesome. And that's what makes you a hopeful Hoosier. That's right. Yeah, thanks for being on the program today. Yeah, thanks for having me. The team at Crossroads Education uses the word common a lot. It's a very powerful word that we commonly take for granted. Common has many different meanings, such as something that is substandard or cheap, ordinary and familiar, or generally known. 
Crossroads Education uses common in the sense that common is a shared space that belongs to the whole community. When Dr. Kevin Burkhopes and his team at Crossroads Education and their other businesses say they are building special classrooms called Learning Commons and neighborhood schools called Community Commons, what they're really building is a common sense of shared community. They're creating dedicated spaces for collaboration and creative learning that teaches both the peer instructors and the students. They're enabling a common or shared responsibility of community members to parent or raise up the next generation of productive members of a more civil society. They're teaching a more meaningful and joyful way to live through serving others. Perhaps most importantly, they're building a sense of home shared by neighbors who want to maintain and grow their hometown instead of flee it. Dr. Burkopes is not only a hopeful Hoosier, he's a true hero for the common good. What can you do to contribute to our common good? I hope this episode sparks some ideas for you to make your positive difference for us here in Indiana. Our common future must be co-created by each of us in ways we choose to be of good service to others. Special thanks to my guest, Dr. Kevin Burkopes. If you found some value in this podcast, I would greatly appreciate your positive Apple Podcast reviews. And also, I hope you'll choose to subscribe to the Hopeful Hoosier podcast wherever you access your podcasts. You can also follow the podcast on Facebook. I invite you to follow me on Twitter and Instagram for updates on future episodes and encouraging and hopeful posts. This also helps us spread our hopeful message. Our theme music was composed and performed by author, speaker, musician, and licensed therapist, Indianapolis's own George Middleton. Until next episode, I'm your hopeful Hoosier host, Andy Dix, encouraging you to go out and make Indiana even better. Thank you for listening. The Hopeful Hoosier podcast is a production of AD Growth Advisors Incorporated, an executive coaching and training firm in Indianapolis. Visit us on the web at adgrowthadvisors.com. The Hopeful Hoosier podcast is a registered trademark of AD Growth Advisors Incorporated, and this podcast is copyrighted 2020 by AD Growth Advisors Incorporated, all rights reserved.